Okay, today is Michael Holston from HP. All of you know that. He is the uh, uh, Executive Vice President and General Counsel for Hewlett Packard. He's responsible for compliance, ethics, ethics, excuse me, privacy, and government affairs functions in the HP uh, and also the HP Company Foundation. Uh, before HP, he was a partner at Morgan, uh, Morgan Lewis, focusing on complex civil litigation in white collar criminal defense. He's a former U.S. attorney a prosecutor in the criminal division of the U.S. Attorney's Office for Pennsylvania. He is also a fellow in the American College of Trial Lawyers and has been acknowledged as one of America's leading lawyers for business. He's also uh, involved with education. He taught at Villanova University for 12 years and also uh, lectured on trial advocacy for the National Institute of Trial Lawyers. He holds a JD from Villanova and a mechanical engineering right from here at Notre Dame. He was recognized as the best lawyer in the Best Lawyers of America in 2006 and 2007. Also, he was recognized as America's leading lawyers for business in 2006 and 2007. He's married, has two daughters, 12 and 15, so there might be a future domer in there. Uh, his wife's name is Brenda, and she is also a lawyer from William and Mary. Michael, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sam, and, and good morning. Um, so it's great to be back uh, here at Notre Dame. Let me start by talking a little bit about HP, because my guess is people don't really appreciate how big we are. So who here has an HP printer? That's good. So who here has uh, an HP laptop or a computer? And, good but not as good. We can do better. So, uh, but uh, people think of us as exactly that, a printer company and a, and a PC and, and notebook company. But uh, we are far broader than that. And actually, uh, most of our profits come from the enterprise side of, side of the house. So we are a Fortune 10 company with $114 billion annual revenue in 2009 with 300 plus thousand employees in 171 countries. Um, so I, it, one of the things we'll talk about as I, as I, as I go through uh, the presentation, but the size and the scale of HP um, is staggering. And when I talk about, you, you think of us because the commercials and the consumer products you know, but on the enterprise side of the house, we, uh, in addition to being the world's biggest PC company and the world's biggest printer company, we are the world's largest seller of servers. We're the second largest company in the world in terms of IT services. So we take outsourcing for companies and universities. So Notre Dame may say, we're going to take, and this is the wave of the future, uh, you think about what an Amazon is doing, you think about what a Google is doing. We would come in to the University of Notre Dame and we'll say, we will manage all of your IT. So you take everything you do, all of your servers, everything, all of your information, we'll run it. We'll run it for you and, and, and you'll tap in to our giant server. So we run over one million servers around the world for, for businesses. We also now do managed printing for people. So this means that at a company or at the University of Notre Dame, rather than you buy all your own printers and you be responsible for buying the supplies and running the whole thing, we will come in and you'll enter a contract with us and we'll just handle all of your printing for you and you'll pay us whatever negotiated rate we have. So we manage over one million printers around the world. That business is up about 20x. In, in, in the last most recent future, or most recent past. We also run over three million PCs and desktop computers for people, for enterprises. So again, keep buying those computers at home, keep buying those PCs, but there's an enterprise side of the business that frankly, as the general counsel, I spend a, a, a substantially larger percentage of my time dealing with that side of the business. And again, in terms of the scope, so we ship basically two printers a second, every second around the world. And we ship more than one PC a second, every second around the world. Um, and that's why we need 300,000 300, employees in, in over 170 countries. And, and so that size and that scope lets us tap into an awful lot of, uh, of issues that impact the whole world. We announced our earnings this coming Monday. We pre-announced 
a strong quarter, but we will announce on Monday. And, and Wall Street, we get as many questions. We get a lot of questions about our business. We get as many questions as anything about where do we think the economy is going. Our, our CEO, I like to tease him, people think of him at this point as almost an economist to predict where the world's going because we sell so much. And I, we sell so much IT, and people view IT as really a predictor of where the economy's going. And in particular, they, they, you know, subsections. What's it look like in Asia? What's it look like in Europe? What's it look like in Eastern Europe? Those are the questions we get because people are figuring out, frankly, from the HPs of the world, when's the economy coming back? Has it started to come back? In what pockets is it coming back? And for us, is it coming back in hardware? Is it coming back in software? Is it coming back in developed countries? Is it coming back in developing countries? Um, so that, that's a lot of the issues that, that we face on that side. Let me back up and talk a little bit about what I do. Uh, Sam mentioned that I'm the, the general counsel, so that means I run the law department um, at HP. I also run our government affairs division and our ethics and compliance team, and I'm in charge of our um, philanthropic foundation for the, for the company. Um, we have over 425 lawyers around the world, uh, about half of them in the United States, about half of them outside the United States. Again, we, are, we would be one of the largest law firms in America if we were a law firm. Um, and we spend over $150 million a year on outside lawyers. So we're also probably one of the largest purchasers of legal services um, in, in the world. So that's a big part of my job. And, and, and to go into the, Sam gave you a little bit of the flavor of my background. I started here, Notre Dame, long, long ago as an engineer. And um, um, Allison and I were, uh, many of you know Allison Levy, we were classmates here. And uh, she can attest to two things. One, I didn't go to class very much. And two, I wasn't a very good student. Um, and uh, those two things, I, it turned out, went hand in hand. Um, but I didn't, you know, actually one of the things to talk about, I wasn't very good at it because I didn't like it. I really didn't like being an engineer. Um, uh, I figured that out about halfway through here, but uh, stayed with it. Decided to go on to law school. And, and interestingly, and, and now I can tell people this, but uh, that my advisor when I got to Villanova told me that I had the lowest GPA of anybody they admitted to the law school uh, from undergraduate. So uh, I said, well, good. There's nowhere to go but up. So uh, it was uh, uh, law school was better. I, I went to class and did a little better. Uh, but it was. Um, you know, for, for things to think about in terms of what do you want to do, and we'll take questions later, I'd say the most important thing, and as I've moved on at, 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 at different places, the number one thing I've seen is the people who do what they really like doing are the most successful people. There's almost no one who comes through HP, be it the engineers, be it the business people, be it the lawyers, be it the scientists, whatever it is. The people who are good have a real passion for what they're doing. You can see it when they come in and talk about what they're working on. If you don't like what you're doing, you're only going to go but so far in it. So if you don't like what you're, what you're thinking about doing, you ought to be thinking about doing something different. Even if you've got to do this job or this education or this is what you're doing for a while, what I always advocate is you need to think about where you want to be long term and you need to find something that you feel, you feel passionate about in terms of the opportunity. So I left engineering, went to law school, and and never look back. And uh, people say, oh, well, you must be a, a patent lawyer. Because, uh, and I say, no, no, I really wasn't a very good engineer. So <laughs> I just had to get away from that and moved into law. I went to the private practice of law for a couple years, a big law firm. Um, and then went to, uh, as Sam mentioned, the United States Attorney's Office, which is the Department of Justice. I was a federal criminal prosecutor um, for, for three or four years um, in, uh, in Philadelphia and in Washington, DC, prosecuted all kinds of crimes. So you prosecute street crime. I did drug cases. I did bank robberies. Um, uh, I did shootouts. Did white collar prosecutions. I did environmental crime. I did insurance crime, uh, tax fraud, um, and all those types of things. Before I returned to private practice at a big firm, and uh, Morgan Lewis, which is one of the big firms in the world, and then did white collar criminal defense, so for corporations and, and high worth individuals and securities fraud and moved over to the other side of the aisle and, and represented uh, companies in that area. And, and interestingly represented the Sisters of St. Mary's um, in a, a criminal investigation, uh, which always gets people's attention when I say I represent the Sisters of St. Mary's in a criminal investigation. But the, the Sisters of St. Mary's used to run uh, St. Joe's 
uh, Memorial Hospital and a bunch of other uh, hospitals around the country, and they got in trouble because some of their doctors uh, were improperly billing Medicaid. And there was a criminal investigation um, of the hospital. So it's nothing quite like sitting in a room with a bunch of nuns if you've gone to 19 years of Catholic education and, uh, and saying, well, sister, I'm a little disappointed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how do we think we got here? Uh, it was uh, um, actually, it, it, you know, I, I do say we ended up, and it's, it's, an, it's an interesting issue for big companies and, and all kinds of big organizations, the power. One of the things that you realize, I became a prosecutor when I was 27 years old. And the power that I had to decide who would get prosecuted for things was, was scary. Um, I look back now, even at the time, I don't think I knew much. I think I knew I didn't know much, but I look back now and think I had that kind of power. We ended up deciding as, as, as an institution that we had to settle that matter because the risk of, of going to a trial was, was so great that the, that the hospital system, the, 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 the sisters uh, decided they couldn't take that risk. And I thought to myself, so a, a group of nuns in South Bend, Indiana, is afraid to go to a jury of its peers to prove that they were not guilty of a crime. Again, it, it, it's a reflection of, you know, there's an awful lot of talk out there right now about corporations and, and that they're bad and that we need more prosecutors going after, uh, uh, going after um, major institutions and major companies. And, and all, I, all I try to encourage people from time to time is keep it in balance. Keep it in balance. You need that balance of power. There are bad organizations. There's also a lot of good organizations. We try to think about doing a lot of good things. At HP, we give away over $50 million a year. Uh, to charities. So there's a, there's a lot of positive in there too and, and there's an awful lot of government power that at times needs to be kept in check. So this is what I did. I tried cases for lots of different companies and again a lot in the criminal world but also uh, I tried cases for companies like Merck. So you, some of you may remember Vioxx uh, was, a, was a, 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 a drug for arthritis. People uh, had some adverse health reactions. I would try cases like that. I would go all around the world, go to Atlantic City, New Jersey, go down to New Orleans, uh, go down to Texas and, and try cases. Great fun, great career. How do you end up at HP from there? So uh, I, I tried I know, hundreds of cases and loved it. It was, it, was a great, it was a great career. But I'd done it for 20 years, and this opportunity came along to move into the executive offices at HP as the general counsel. And, and uh, it's, it's the best decision I've ever made in terms of doing that. And, and joining HP as the general counsel, the breadth of issues that we see. So in, in the most intimidating thing is you realize yet again how many areas of the law you don't know anything about. So I'm not an intellectual, you know, I, my list of what I'm not tends to be a lot longer. I'm not an intellectual property lawyer. I'm not an, a mergers and acquisition lawyer. I'm not a securities lawyer. What you get paid for, ultimately, and I'd say it's true of every one of the executives in our front office. We all have a background or a specialty, but what we really get paid for at the end of the day is judgment. And what we get paid for is, is a certain amount of life experience and judgment to bring to the particular issue that you're dealing with. And, and so our executive team is made up of obviously our CEO and, and our chief financial officer. We have heads of three businesses. There's myself, there's a, a, a chief technology officer who's our big thinker about where's the world going. He'd be a perfect guy for your futurist class, Sam. He thinks about where's the, where's the next product going to be and where's it headed. And, and the most interesting thing, we have a head of HR who sits in on these meetings. The most interesting thing about those meetings and why I think uh, we succeed when we do as a management team is it's a bunch of people with completely different backgrounds and a completely different way of thinking about things in terms of the analytical approach that's brought to it. Uh, our chief technology officer, our sort of futurist thinker, I can see him when, when I'm talking, looking at me like, wow, I would never ever have even thought to worry about something like that. And he will think of things that will never even occur to me. And our chief financial officer brings a completely different um, perspective to things. So one of the things I find most interesting, and again, a well-assembled team, 
has people who bring completely different perspectives and completely different experiences, love what they do, have their own specialty area, but when we come together, we think about things in a completely different way, makes for, makes for fascinating and exciting debates about how should we handle a particular issue. Um, the same is true in our boardroom. I'm also the uh, secretary of our board of directors. And um, putting together that team uh, of a board, and we've added two board members in the last year, it, it's, it's a lot like a sports team in, in some ways. You really need different people who play different roles. And, and, and then you need the right chemistry. Um, HP got in a little bit of trouble several years ago in, um, with some of its board members before I got to the company and some issues where they didn't get along. They had some conflicts <laughs> spilled out into the press and it was, it was pretty unattractive. Um, and, and I think it really caused a focus on how do we as an organization want to work together? How, how do the board members need to interact with one another? And so again, on our board, we have sitting CEOs, we have ex-CEOs, we have chief financial officers from companies existing and, and, uh, and retired. And, and then we also have, we just brought onto the board last year, a guy named Mark Andreessen. Uh, he joined us in September. Mark was the, um, the original, one of the original founders of Netscape um, way, way, way back when. He's also one of the most intelligent um, uh, software entrepreneurs in the world. He's 38 years old. Uh, completely different guy than the CEO. We have the CEOs of, of two of the Fortune 25 companies further along in their careers. It's great to watch them interact. And again, what I, what, 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 back to my earlier comment, the thing that's most impressive about Mark, a brilliant guy. Mark does exactly what he wants to do. And, he's, and we talked about it. He, he was a college guy who came up with the idea for the browser uh, with a bunch of other people at Netscape and went to Netscape, got that started. His career has been all over the place because he finds an idea that he's interested in, he chases that idea. Um, and get, engages in that um, issue until he's seen it through, he's sold the company, he's done whatever. But again, a completely different background. A guy who has no idea how to manage 320,000 people. Uh, I love Mark, he's a brilliant director. He's our idea guy. He's the guy who sits there and says, this is what you should be thinking about. This is where the world's going. People talk about cloud computing and things like that. He's the guy who says, I can tell you he can sit there almost as a visionary. I can tell you where the world's going. I can tell you the next products. I can tell you what people want. Not the guy I would pick to operationalize that and figure out how he can get 320,000 people marching towards that. We have other guys who, you know, we have the former CEO of a bank. Probably not the guy we want sitting around thinking about what computers we're going to create, uh, what the next printer invention should be. But the guy who can say, I'm going to take that idea and I can figure out how to run a P&L off of that and how to operationalize all of that. So it's, um, it's a good combination of people. And frankly, in any of the ventures I've been involved in, I've found that's the combination you need to put together. So let me, let me do this. I know we had a lot of time for questions later. I want to make sure that I'm touching on the things that you all want to talk about. So. Um, if I could, here sort of maybe at halftime, take a question or two if anybody has a question, and then um, we can dive back into some more information. Does anybody want to want to lob one out now, or should I keep going? Well, you said that you uh, defend the sisters of, say, Aries. How did that case end up turning out? Sure. So uh, represent the sisters of St. Mary's. We wrote a check to the United States government and, uh, and settled. That's how most things with the United States government end up resolving themselves. You write a check to them. Yeah, so I, um, I, you know, I also take um, a lot of court-appointed um, criminal defense cases. And so I actually met my wife representing uh, a guy on death row in Alabama. Um, um, I am not a believer in the death penalty, despite having been a federal prosecutor. So I took a case representing a guy who spent 21 years on death row in Alabama for being accused of uh, 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 African-American uh, in, in Birmingham, Alabama, accused of killing the son of a white minister. Um, he spent 21 years on death row. I worked on that case um, for, for a number of years. Went into the Justice Department while the case was still going on. The case took 10 years to resolve. My wife, now wife, showed up as a young associate working on that case after I left. Uh, and that's how we met. Ended up getting the guy a new trial. 
1990, he went on death row in 1976 and 1997, was found not guilty um, and, and free. And one of the coolest things of my life, my mentor um, as a young child, when I was a young child lawyer, ultimately went on to become the general counsel of Merck. And um, he received an award for doing this case. We had dinner at the United States Supreme Court with, with Justice Ginsburg and Bo Cochran. My client has spent 21 years on, on death row and a justice from the United States Supreme Court in the United States Supreme Court having dinner. That, to me, was a big part of what attracted me to the law. Still today, I can tell you we've signed up at HP. To, I'll talk about some of the other cases in a minute. But we've signed up at HP to something called the Corporate Pro Bono Challenge. And so I get all of my lawyers, actually hosted a dinner last week to raise money for, for, for um, legal organizations around the country who represent people, um, uh, indigent clients. We get, when we bring our resources to bear, we can get, we've got over 100 people right now volunteering to do free legal work for people. And we're trying to get big companies all over the place, all over the country, and ultimately all over the world to do that kind of work. There's a tremendous need for that. One of the things I love the best about being a lawyer is, in addition to having the intellectual challenges of my day-to-day -day job at HP um, and doing things where you can represent big companies, you can represent individuals, you can also, it, it's encouraged, it's really, it, it, it's one of the things I love about the legal profession is people want to do volunteer work. So I spent, I spent, at the same time that I would be representing a Fortune 10 company or the CEO of a Fortune 20 company in some massive civil matter, I'd be rep I represented a guy who got arrested at the Philadelphia International Airport because he'd swallowed 64 condoms filled with heroin. Um, uh, he was a mule. He goes to Guatemala, Mexico. You swallow condoms that are filled with heroin. You enter the United States on the plane, and you pass them. And then you make for doing that. And by the way, if one of those burst, you're dead. Because it, it basically, the, you, and you have a certain amount of time. They wrap them inside of a condom, and they put electrical tape around them, and then you swallow them, and your stomach acid starts to eat in, into them. And if you don't get off the plane and pass them quick enough, one of those will burst, and you'll die. And the guy gets five hundred dollars to do that. So uh, I represented, I represented a guy who did that in a trial, and got found not guilty. Um, and and uh, so and it's one of those odd combinations where you say, and it's, we were just talking about it last week at this pro bono uh, pro bono dinner. You know, you talk, that interesting comment, is that the right result? Uh, you know, um, but do you believe in the system at the end of the day? And professionally, do you? You know, and ultimately, by the way, he was deported and and, and sent back. But the opportunity to do that case and in the legal profession. Uh, you know, I can remember, because he got some news coverage in Philadelphia at the time, and I remember having to show up at one of my corporate clients the next day. Uh, and they sort of looked at me and said, you know, that's what you do? <laughs> when you're not representing us, that's what you, that's what you do? So there's, there's opportunities uh, like that in the law, which is one of the things that, that, that attracted me to it. But um, again, to me, a passion for believing that everybody's entitled to, uh, uh, to their day in, in court. Um, the Attorney General of the United States is a very good friend of mine. I worked with him in private practice, Eric Holder. He's taken a lot of heat this week on the concept that, that uh, um, he's going to try this, uh, the Karzai case in, uh, um, um, in New York in regular court instead of taking it to a military tribunal. And, and he got the snot beat out of him in the Senate on uh, Wednesday for having, for having decided to do that. And we had a whole debate about it yesterday over dinner, or two days ago, at dinner of our boardroom. And, 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 you know, ultimately, the question is, do you believe in the rule of law? Do you believe that our system would work? Uh, and do you believe that a person's entitled to a trial and, 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 and see where it will come out? Um, and so, th th again, those kinds of questions, uh, to me, I, I, I find enjoyable uh, to work on. So, what else? We have some more? Sure. And so the, 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 question, uh, the question was, as the head of the ethics and the compliance team as well, how do you balance, how do you balance that inside the, inside the company? And, and you know, I, I, as I started, I you know, sort of jokingly said that um, 
all the things that I'm not when I got hired as a general counsel. My background obviously was in this area as a former federal prosecutor and, and, and uh, as a person who was in law enforcement. I, I think that my hiring sent a message in terms of how HP wants to do things. And, and when I go around and talk to our employee base, I make it clear to, that our CEO sent a message. He, I had never been in-house in my life. Most general counsel come up somewhere through the ranks and were in-house and, and to become the general counsel of a Fortune 10 company, usually either general counsel of a smaller company and you work your way up. Our CEO wanted to make a statement. He wanted it to be clear that we were going to do things the right way and that this was a, a big deal. And, and not only is Mike going to be the general counsel, the ethics and compliance team reports to him. And I view it as, and we talk about this a lot, in terms of what's a big company's responsibility in terms of how do you do things and do it the right way? And what's our job in trying to do that? And so when our team, what we talk about is the first thing we have to do is we have to set, we really write and set what we call our standards of business conduct. This is how we're going to operate. This is the way we're going to do business. And then we say, all right, now we've got to train everybody. We've got to go tell them what the rules are and what we expect them to do and what they're not allowed to do. Then and we working with our finance team and our audit team, you have to go out and audit people. Are they doing what they're supposed to do? Or are they not doing what they're supposed to do? And then when we find the people who invariably with 300,000 people, we have people who do stuff wrong. It's funny, I spoke on a panel with a federal judge recently who said, if you have a good compliance program, there shouldn't be any violations. Nobody should do anything wrong. We said, well, you know, that's a great idea. It's a good theory, Judge. But uh, if you can find me a city with 300,000 people where there's no crime, I'll move there. With 300,000 people, you're going to have people who do things that aren't supposed to do. Our job is to audit, make sure we try and find them. And then when we catch them, what do you do with those people? And that really, that to me, is the guts of how do you send the message of what kind of company you want to be. Because it's easy with the guy who you don't really care about. It's hard when you catch the guy who's one of your best salespeople, who did something he wasn't supposed to do. Are you, you know, that's really the test at the end of the day of does the company mean what it says? Because this is one of our best sales guy, and we just found out that he paid a commercial bribe to get business. Are you going to fire him? Or are you going to slap him on the wrist and take away some of his bonus? So our view, my view, and certainly when I talked to my boss before I took the job is, I know where I want that answer to come out. He felt the same way. And again, we're able to send that message. I think in the hiring, that message was there, and we followed through on it. And by the way, then you have to figure out the right way to publicize that inside the company. You know, because if you fire them and nobody knows, that's not as good. You've got HR constraints. I've got lawyers who work for me who say you're not allowed to use his name and tell stories about him, and you know, he'll sue you for that. So you have to find that right way to communicate to the employee base. If you do this, you will be fired. It doesn't matter who you are. We will exit you from the company. And then you've got to think about, do we need to do more training? Where do we have more of our violations? And, and again, in the world of companies this big, the metrics we have are, are remarkable. We have hotlines for people to call in employee hotlines for people to call in about things. We track every complaint we get. We track them by region. We track them by business. We track them by types. We look at them quarter to quarter and see whether the trends are up or the trends are down. And then we refocus the training based on that. If we have more people, one of the biggest issues most big companies have, where do we get our employees from? We steal them from our competitors. <laughs> where do they get their employees from? They steal our guys. So I mean, they, you know, we ultimately hire all of you as you come up through the ranks. But in the meantime, People are trading back and forth, and especially in the business world, we're going to have somebody who's worked at some point. Half our, half our sales force has probably worked at some point at IBM or Cisco or Dell. And by the way, half of their sales force, same thing. But when you come, you, I don't want you to bring any trade secret information. You can't bring competitive intelligence. So it's my job to make sure when they come in, they don't do that. The other half of my job is to make sure when they leave, they don't take any of our stuff with them. So, um, and, and when we catch somebody who did, you got to get rid of them. You got to deal with them, you got to fire them, and you got to be aggressive about it. At the end of the day, you build a culture that, that, that um, I, I think people get um, that's how you're going to do business. And in my opinion, again, having done, represented probably a third of the Fortune 100 at some point in my 20 years when I was in private practice, there are different cultures. Just like there are different cultures at universities, there are different cultures um, all over the place. There are different cultures at major corporations in terms of how you want to do business and how you don't want to do business. And, and it's the little things where you make that culture 
stand up because everybody walks around and says the same thing. Our standards of business conduct look like everybody else's. They're public. You can go online. You can read them. IBM's look like ours. GE's look like ours. Or ours look like theirs. You can say it any way you want. It's what do you do in practice? How do you want to turn around and, and enforce them that makes the difference? And that's a tough conversation. You're sitting there with the, with the, with the head of the business, and you're saying, I'm going to take Bob, and we've got to get rid of him. And I know he runs one of the biggest countries in the region, and, and, and he's generating a lot of revenue, and we're very profitable. But we can't keep him after he did what he did. Those are hard, again, those are, are hard conversations. And, and I used to say in 2007, when I took this job, it was an easier job then because the business climate was going like this. People don't cheat as much when there are 20% above their quota. It's when you're not going to be able to make your sales to make your quota and keep your job in a tougher economy where people start doing things that become a little more challenging. Um, and, and we had to have the discipline and the backbone to say, and the culture to say, doesn't matter. That's not what we're going to tolerate. I sit on an executive committee of a general counsel group of Fortune 100 companies. We get together twice a year. No cameras, no, and we talk about issues. And we, and we share information about what do people care about. And I hear stories from some of my peers and realize how lucky I am that I have a management team that supports those ideas. Um, and I believe at the end of the day, we're more successful as a result. But um, yeah, in either event, that's the answer you've got to go with. Some other questions? Sure. So. I, did, I didn't plant you, but I was hoping that would come up eventually. I'm sure all of you read that Newsweek just rated us the number one green company in the world. So um, we have uh, recycled. Uh, I always the, the data guys. I forget. We've recycled more e-waste than anybody in the world. I forget how many millions of tons. The numbers get so big, it, 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 I forget. But we are the number one recycler of electronic waste in the world. Um, it's, it's been a big issue. Again, we, we were probably there ahead of a lot of other people because of the printers. Um, so electronic waste, I mean, you know, ink is a chemical. Um, and so how we handled the back end of that has been an issue we've been thinking about for a lot longer than a lot of our computer competitors have been thinking about. So we've been, we've been way ahead of them. And, and so I'm proud of where we are. It's a huge issue. We view it as a marketing opportunity because in, and certainly it is our view we survey people all of the time and our marketing surveys say people in college now and people your age and people just out of college that's a big deal and so becoming the number one green company in the world is going to help you people will think about that the next time they make a choice on what computer or what printer they're going to buy so we spend a lot of time working on that and again it doesn't that piece of it we also look at, and I'll tell you where the world's going, because there was some new legislation that was just proposed this week in the United States. Right now, a lot of the focus has been the back end and carbon footprint and, and how do you dispose of, um, of electronic materials. The next wave, where the world's going, is where do those materials come from? And a lot of those materials come from, from Africa and, and, and are obtained in ways for some people that people wouldn't be all that happy to hear about. Um, we've been a big supporter of changing and getting legislation passed that says people are going to be responsible for how those minerals are mined in the first place in, in the Congo and in other parts of the world. Because right now, as you can imagine, Hewlett Packard doesn't manufacture many of its own computers. We're in charge of thinking about what do we want in there, what do we want the design to be, what, material, what, what software do we want in there. But the same people are going and mining that for a lot of different people. We can't force those people to do something different if we're alone. And we, we, we've been very active. Again, part of my job as government affairs in Washington, D.C. has been to say, if we can get legislation that moves it, that that's a requirement, now everybody will move in the same direction and require those minerals to be mined in a different way. Um, 
there's a there's an aftermarket when we don't get to recycle them. It's I mean there are there are there are scary things that are that go on out there that you have no idea uh, in terms of the business. When we don't get to recycle some of these products, there are, there's an aftermarket of people who buy these things, put them on ships, cargo ships, send them down to Africa, put them in a truck, put them out in the middle of somewhere, and just dump them and leave them there. And you know, if somebody thinks it's a cheaper way to do it, there's going to be a business for it, and people pay for that. And 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 so we, uh, and some of our competitors have been trying to lead efforts in terms of legislation that will take away that aftermarket because now it will criminalize that behavior, um, and and force corporations, all of our competitors, uh, around the globe to behave the right way. So it's a, it's a an issue we think a lot about. We care. We've been in business for 70 years. Uh, which doesn't seem like a long time. The Silicon Valley, that's like five lifetimes. Um, you know, because Google's, you know, 10 years old and, and we're 70, 70. We're the grandfather of the Silicon Valley. We care about our brand. We intend to be here another 70 plus another 70 and those kinds of issues. Good news is, I think, with, the, with, with your generation, sadly, I can't put myself in your generation anymore, but so I'll say your generation cares about those things and says that they care about them. And the real, the real question you need to ask yourself is, is, are you going to back it up with your wallet in terms of the decisions you make in terms of what you purchase? Because that's what will drive the business to go in a different direction. When you talk with your pocketbook, that'll change the answer. If you just sit around a room and talk about it and then go buy the cheapest product, you're going to end up with a lot of the same problems. If you sit there and say, no, this matters to me, I'm going to read that and I'm going to find the companies that handle it that way and I'll pay a little bit extra because they're going to manage it the right way. When you see that happen, that'll change the, that'll change the equation. What else is on your minds? So when I was uh, an undergraduate, I worked for Notre Dame Security. <laughs> and I had, um, I had, this is a story, Sam, you promised, you're going to record this and we'll put it out, right? But I think the statute of limitations has lapsed on this, and I think I'm probably safe. So, um, out on Eddy Street, where the, where I saw the new complex is now, there used to be a, a series of uh, bars out there. Um, and so when you and, and running right through between the athletic and convocation center and the football stadium was the was was the road. So that was a lot of place where Notre Dame security would walk around and keep an eye on people. So one night I was out there walking around this young undergrads who I don't think were probably 21, but were on their way back from the bar, um, said we just got jumped by some guy who took all our money. Uh, um, in pair, in his, what was he wearing? Jeans and, and, and a jean jacket. So I said, oh, okay. Uh, I, you know, I have my walkie-talkie, so jeans and jean jacket should be easy. Um, so I called it in and went looking. So I see some guy walking down the street. And I start walking a little faster. He crosses the street. I cross the street. I walk a little faster. He, he crosses the street again. I cross the street again. He starts to run. I chase him. I tackle him. I apprehend the suspect. I said, give me back the money. He hands me all the money. I sent him on his way. I come back to the Notre Dame security office, and I say, I got the guy. And they said, we caught the guy. <laughs> I said, well, that's, a, that's an unfortunate situation. <laughs> the, uh, the guy we caught confessed, and the two students recognized him, and that's the guy. And I said, well, I got like $35 here <laughs> from some poor kid who was walking back from school. So luckily that was 25 years ago, and I think I'm safe now. So uh, <laughs> that, was my, that was my original law enforcement career So before I went to the Justice Department. Uh, and then you get, when you, when you join the Justice Department, depending on what division, at one point I worked on some more sensitive stuff, and you have to take lie detector tests. And they ask you questions of whether, and I'm thinking, and I've had them administered by that point in time for a whole bunch of people who, uh, you know, when I was a prosecutor, you would have informants take lie detector tests. And so I, I've seen them done, and they're, it's a scary process when you really think about it. And they hook you up to all kinds of machines and all stuff. So they're going to hook me up now and ask me if I've ever committed a crime. 
And I thought to myself, <laughs> they give you a chance to confess beforehand. So I told them that story um, at that point in time. That's the only other time I've ever told that story. But uh, um, they, they decided that I would not be prosecuted for that. And, uh, and they would let me keep my job. But, um. <clears throat> what else? Yep. That's a great question. Um, for me, I took the job. I was 44. I'd been practicing for almost 20 years. Um, every time I would get a new trial, you'd learn a new business, you'd learn a new industry. But basically, I was a trial lawyer. It was my job to take their facts and put them into the system that I knew. And I, like I said, I tried 100 cases. It wasn't that it was getting old. I still found it, as a, a guy like sports, I liked the competition. I liked it. What I liked about a trial was the end of it, you either win or you lose. There aren't that many things in the business world where it's that obvious. Twelve people say, I agree with you or I agree with her. And, and that's the answer. But this job, I learned completely new things. And I found that in my mid-40s, I was learning things I knew nothing about. And I was the dumbest guy in the room in terms of whatever that subject matter was. And to me, that was very invigorating. To, to, you know, I, was, I, never, I didn't go to business school. I never took a business class. When I was here as an engineer, I'd take lots of liberal arts classes so I could keep my GPA up. But um, yeah, and, then I went to, and then I went to law school. But ultimately, I, I, really, I had no idea how to read a P&L other than you know, sort of what I taught myself for, for various financial cases I did. So to sit in a room and with, some, and with some brilliant financial people and watch the way they take apart a P&L and watch the way they take apart a business and figure out uh, the operational expenses of that, to me, was fascinating to learn about that. Then to be sitting in a room with our guys from HP Labs, who are our guys who invent stuff and sit around and listen to them talk, because we're in charge of the intellectual property getting patents for everything they, they invent. So to me, the challenge of doing brand new things, I can always go back and, and be a trial lawyer again. After having done it this long, I could, I could go take that challenge on. But to get the opportunity to, um, to get engaged in different things that, and, and use, my, use my brain in a way that I hadn't ever used it or hadn't used it in a long time was very challenging to me. The other thing that was really, back to sort of the compliance question, in particular when you do what, what I did as a trial lawyer, I cleaned up messes. You know, by, the time I, by the time they called me, it was a mess. The milk was on the floor, the cookies were on the floor, the glass was broken, and it was, let's go clean this up. Um, what I like about HP now is the opportunity on the ethics of compliance to try and get out there ahead of it, to try and say, I'm going to try and figure out how we train people so that we don't make as many messes, um, and, and try and be proactive in avoiding those kinds of problems. To me, that, that had a real appeal as well. Do we have any? Uh, I know that some of the, the law school was invited. Did any of the law students wander their way over? There we go, the guy with the tie, that's still looking tie. <laughs> so by the way, when you know you come from the East Coast to California and you come from a law firm to a company, I showed up looking like this. And you know, my lawyers are in you know blue jeans and turtlenecks and, and the biggest question I got for the first month was, like, we're gonna have to wear suits? <laughs> oh, we have to wear a tie? So I said you don't have to, but I like the guys who do. No. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Do you have any questions? What year are you in at law school? Third year. Have you? Go ahead. Well, I was U.S. attorney. Sure. So, um, the question was: Can I talk about any white collar cases I did when I was a U.S. attorney in in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, which is Philadelphia? A, a chemical company that will go unnamed um, had a plant, and it used to have, I love this term, the marketing guys came up with it, they called it puffbacks. <laughs> it means stuff came out of the chimneys um, and landed on things, um, including cars. And they were self-insured, but there was an insurance company that would process the claims, and people would show up and say, this stuff is all over my car, I need my car painted. And, um, and, and so they um, um, started processing the claims. And the insurance company now was not motivated to deny the claims because they got an administrative fee based on every time they processed a claim. And the, the, the company that was putting the stuff out really didn't want a lot of press on this, so they wrote the checks. 
And so a bunch of body shop guys and a bunch of insurance adjusters got together and decided this is the best thing they'd ever seen. So the next time one of these things happened, lo and behold, an awful lot of people, as it turned out, friends and family, had been parked in Marcus Hook, Pennsylvania that night um, and got their cars painted, except they didn't get their cars painted. They got a check for 2500 bucks, 3000 bucks, and they split it up between the guy whose car it was, the body shop guy, and the insurance adjuster. And I'm talking millions of dollars by doing this. So we showed up and started investigating um, the case. And there were all kinds of interesting things that, that, that came out of going. And ultimately, it got pretty high up in the insurance company. Those guys knew what was going on. They track everything, too. Um, but they were making a lot of money off of it. So we went after those guys. But we also we had to get the witnesses to figure out how it happened. And so I, in, in, when you're a prosecutor, you have a grand jury. And the way it works in the real world, it's not like it works on TV. You have the same grand jury. They come in and they sit every week, on a, let's say, on a Tuesday afternoon, and you present evidence. And it could take a year to present all the evidence. So you work it outside the room with the FBI, and then you come in and you present, um, you present the evidence to the grand jury. And it's, the grand jury is people who have to come every Tuesday for two years. So it's mostly, mostly very young people and very old people. And so we were in there, and we'd bring in one person after another. We knew we're lying. You live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Why were you in Marcus Hook? You live in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Why were you in Marcus Hook? People, there's different strands of story, but one strand of story is, well, listen, it's kind of embarrassing. I'd rather not have to say it, but I was down at a bar in Marcus Hook, and I met this woman. And I went home with her, and I left my car there. And that's how it got um, destroyed. So we brought in like eight people who told this story uh, the same day. And we're going through, and at the very end, this, uh, we always, the prosecutor asks all the questions, and you open to the grand jury, and he says, anybody here have any questions? And one of the grand jurors <laughs> raises his hand. This guy's like 75 years old. And I said, yeah. He says, I'd like to ask a witness a question. And I said, okay. And he says, what's the name of the bar? <laughs> I said, well, you know, that's really not the, that's not really the focus here. But um, it was, uh, it was uh, we ended up prosecuting, I don't know, several dozen people um, in, in connection with that, uh, in connection with that case. And then one other thing I will tell you, we ultimately got one of the, we were talking about this because you probably, many of you probably read about Galleon and the hedge funds that just got prosecuted for insider trading um, and that there was wiretaps uh, out there. And so... At lunch, among our executive team, I have more interesting stories than the CFO does. So they always ask me about these kinds of things. And um, one of the guys from the body shop that we got to work for us, we got wired up his office with cameras um, to record people as he would pay off the money. And so we put a little camera, and the FBI had a little, basically, stereo. And in one of the speakers, it was a, it was a camera. And so uh, I was the best witness I ever had in my whole life. Because the guys come in, the guy says, "What's?" The? And everybody at this point knew we were investigating because we were taking people into the grand jury. And and the guys, one of the guys comes in who's getting ready to uh, take his payout. And what's the? When did you get that stereo? Was you, are you are you recording this? And the guy walked in and said, "Yeah, I am." And he picked up the thing that was the camera. The speaker said, "This is a camera. This is it. I'm filming you right now." Uh, he says, "Say hello to the FBI." And he was. Filming them. And he says, you know, take a look. You want me to open it up? We can take it apart. You can see the camera, but go ahead and say your name. And the guy looked at him and he said, oh, I was just, I was just asking, Larry. It's not that. No, no, no. You don't believe me? And, you know, it's obviously the, the language is much saltier. Um, but he went through the whole thing. And I got to tell you, and the guy didn't, I was like, man, that guy's got to be. I, now when I watch these poker tournaments, I think, man, you put that guy in that poker tournament, he wins <laughs> lots of money. He ultimately put it back down, and sure enough, he had filmed the whole Film the whole thing. So um, that, uh, again, that work was, uh, to me, one of the greatest jobs I, I ever had was being a prosecutor. Um, and and um, it's funny, as a lawyer, you'll experience this soon when you go out, and especially when you're out with all your business colleagues, and they say, what do you do? And you say you're a lawyer. They all kind of, uh, uh. when you're a prosecutor, people like, that's the one lawyer that people like. But otherwise, when they say you're a lawyer, it's, it's not nearly as, you know, usually the business guys look at you like, uh, uh, you know, not too positive. And that's the other thing I say when I went when I went from private practice to HP. The one downside, I talk about all the upsides. I used to be revenue, now I'm an expense. Um, so, <laughs> which you, you get looked at differently when you're no longer revenue. What else? Uh, what else can I can I tell people? Yep. It 
it's a, it's a good question. So the question was, as a prosecutor, how do you decide who you're going to prosecute? Is it an economic issue? Is it a moral issue? Um, it, so you start, I, I think, and it depended where you sat. At the time, I sat as the guy who had files who landed on my desk. And, and my job was just, can I make out a case or can I not make out a case? And for me, it was, can I, can I prove it? And somebody else, at the time, somebody else got to tell me which cases I worked on. And that was important because I thought about just, can I prove it? First of all, and then, you know, you'd have to decide, do I think, do I believe that this person is guilty? And, and do the agents I'm working with believe this person is guilty? And then can we prove it? Um, and then you would work that case. As it got older and more uh, senior, you look at it now. Where are you going to set your priorities? What do you want to go after? What do you want to prosecute? Um, and, and where do you want to spend your resources? Because the reality is there is a resources issue. Uh, there's a lot of crime, and you're going to have to make the decisions about what you want to focus on um, in terms of, of, of a prosecutor. You can sit there and say, in the streets of Philadelphia, I can point you to the neighborhood. Then on any given night, I can guarantee you there's a lot of drug sales going on. Um, and you can go out there with a van and the DEA and the Philadelphia police, and you could arrest 50 people. Um, and the next night, there'll be 50 different people standing out there um, selling those drugs, because that's a guy who makes 25 bucks a night to stand on a street corner in the dead of winter and sell you know, $20 bags of drugs. Um, once you decide to arrest those 25 people, every one of them is entitled to their own lawyer. And none of them can afford their own lawyer, so the state pays for a lawyer for all those people. And you decide you're going to put all of them through a trial. So a guy like me had to prosecute that case. The cops had to show up and testify. A judge has to be there. You have to pick 12 jurors. And so now I look at it from an operational business perspective. And you sit there and say, every now and then you want to go do that because you want to send the message. And frankly, part of the message you're trying to get to is the person who's going to buy, because we arrest those people too, and, and send that message. But I could, I, could, I could fill the entire docket of, of, the, of the federal courts in Philadelphia going after those people. Not a good, my opinion, not a good use of resources. Um, how do you balance? How much of that do you, do you do against when you're going after, when do you want to go after securities fraud? Do you want to go after insider trading? An insider trading case is, is almost the exact opposite. It takes a long time to make that case. It's, so here you can do vast quantities of people. It takes a lot of resources. But the arrest, it's a, you know, it's a reactive crime. At the time you arrest them, they've already committed the crime. An insider trading case takes months, maybe a year or more, to build, subpoenaing lots of records, looking at all kinds of records. Those are important to do. And I think a good attorney general, a good United States attorney, a good district attorney is sitting there saying, where do I find that balance? How much of my resources do I want to put over here? How much of my resources? Do, do I want to put over on white collar crime? There's a lot of debate about whether there was enough prosecution of regulatory offenses in the last eight or 10 years. It's the right debate to have without any regard to what, what any of us might think the answer is. I think there needs to be more debate about where do you want to put those resources, uh, resources to work. What else? Sure. Uh, so uh, my older brother is our four, bro uh, three brothers, four of us. We all went to Notre Dame. One was uh, an econ major. One was pre med. I was an engineer. Uh, and the other, I don't, I don't remember what he studied, if anything. But we all ended up going to law school, um, and are lawyers. Uh, my older brother was in law school here at Notre Dame when I was an undergraduate, and he did his mock trial um, for. Um, for law school, and and I went. Oh, I was his witness. You know, I played the played the role of the witness. And I went and watched. And my older brother, way smarter than I am. He's a ta he went to a big firm. He's a tax attorney. He's a brilliant guy. Perhaps the worst trial lawyer on the planet. Had he become a trial lawyer, it's just not his thing. And I watched him do this with his partner, and they were terrible. And I was like, <laughs> kind of watched their opponents. I'm like, they're terrible. Uh, and I, but I also thought this is fun. This is, you know, again, I loved that win-lose dynamic. Um, and I loved the opportunity of trying to persuade a bunch of people. Um, and, and I watched them do that. And, I, and it, was a, it, was a, it was earlier in my undergraduate career. And I thought, that's what, I, I like that. And I'd like to do that. And he sort of shelved it away at the time. And then when I was a senior, I got some engineering. I was going out interviewing for jobs in the fall. 
And I, I, back to my comments from earlier, I looked at what I was going to do with these companies I was getting hired by, and I thought, I don't even like what that guy does. You know, they're interviewing me, and you'd go around, you'd do your interview, and then you'd get invited back to the plant or the headquarters, and you'd watch what they did. And I think, I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. Um, and so I, it's probably a bad idea to go take that job. Um, and, and the law school thing sort of came back to me. I took the LSATs. Um, if I had the lowest undergraduate grade point average there, you figure I did okay in that part of it. And so they said, well, maybe he has an aptitude for this, and we'll, we'll let him go do that. So uh, for me, that juxtaposition between when I, when I met these engineers, I, I became an engineer because I was really good at math. And people say, well, you don't want to study math because you can't get a job. This is what my dad said. I, I, from a, I'm from a family where no one had ever gone to college. And so my father said, you need to study something in college that you're going to be able to get a job with when you're done. And you're good at math, go be an engineer. And so I decided to do, and I hated it, as I say. And then I looked at what people did, who did it for a living, and I said, and, and, no, and I wouldn't have been any good at it. I mean, I'd have gotten by, but I wouldn't have been any good at it. And then when I watched this, this trial, I thought, that's something I think I can be good at, and that's something that I think I really like. Um, and it was, it was a very hard call for me to quit being a trial lawyer um, because I did enjoy it. But for the reasons that we talked about, I decided it was, it was the better, uh, it, was the, it was the right call for me. So I, I, Earl, I don't know what stage you are in your career at school, but as you start to think about what you want to do, you should try and find opportunities that where people do what it is you think you might want to do and find out what they, what they really do. We, we at, at uh, HP are big in internships. And uh, we have a lot. We, I don't know. Sam actually asked me. I don't know as, how much of it we have on the business side. We have a lot of it on the engineering, um, science, tech side of things. And we started doing it on the law side as well. We started bringing in um, law students for the summer. Uh, but by the time you're in law school, it's really more what kind of lawyer do you want to be. Um, in the business world, I think it's far more open. Um, and, and so I, I'd really encourage you to try and find the, the things that you, that, that, that you sort of say, I, I, let me find out what the people who have my degree or what I, it sounds, it sounds interesting. Let me go find out what they really do all day long. Because you spend, an, if, if you're going to be good at whatever you do, you're going to spend a lot of time doing it. Um, and if you're going to spend a lot of time doing it, it ought to be something you really, you really find um, uh, enjoyable to do. So I, to me, when I was a prosecutor, it was a good time in my career. I, as I said, I had just left and, and started dating and then marrying my wife. I, I had all the time in the world. I would work for forever. I was the best deal the taxpayers ever had. I, I, it was the most interesting stuff. I felt good about what I was doing, and I worked, I worked all the time. I think that the notion that I would have put that many hours into doing some type of mechanical engineering probably wouldn't have, been, probably wouldn't have happened. So. I'll also tell you that we are now, look around the room and stay close to everybody, because I was mentioning to Sam that uh, um, I've now, um, the guy who runs the legal department for me in Asia was one of my college roommates um, um, here at Notre Dame. And, and since we're going for full confessions here today, Sam, I lived with him uh, senior year. I lived in Holy Cross. You're going to say, what? It was a dorm. They tore it down long ago. As my brothers like to point out, I'm so old that my dorm has been torn down. But uh, ultimately, I moved off campus. Um, for a lot of years, we like to say that that was a voluntary decision on my part. Um, and that's what my parents believed. But uh, it was not. Um, and lived with the guy who uh, helped me uh, in the exiting process. He also was encouraged to, to move off campus. And uh, he's now the lawyer who runs Asia Pacific. So he lives in Singapore and runs all of uh, our Asia legal, legal operations. And the guy who runs our HP financial services business also uh, a Notre Dame graduate. So I've been accused of creating a, a Notre Dame mafia within the HP legal department, uh, which I don't really try to deny. And we also have a Villanova mafia going on, uh, going on as well. But the truth is, for me, I, I say it jokingly, but I've known this guy for 27 years of my life. He's on the other end of the world running our legal operations. He's got a couple hundred people that work for him that ultimately work for me down there. He's, on, he's 14 hours difference time zone. So when he's in bed, I'm awake and vice versa. I needed somebody that I... And, and, and the emerging markets are the places where the business culture is most different. 
um, it, it, in terms of what's appropriate and what's legal is very different history in some of your emerging countries in Asia than it is in the United States. I wanted a guy there who I trusted implicitly, who I knew, who, I knew who he was as a person. I lived with him. So I knew what kind of guy he was, and I knew, I, I knew at the core what kind of guy he was as we were trying to build out that legal team down there that I had a guy I knew I could trust. So I went and got him from another company and, and said, you're going to go you're going to go run the Asia legal department. It was one of the best decisions I ever made because we get together a few times a year. We're completely, we're completely aligned on what's going on. So um, in all seriousness, you're going to look back. Whatever you do, you're going to land someplace, and there's going to be a group of people here. And law school is even more so. I'll run into somebody who I, in, 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 in practice, when I was practicing law, um, or as my daughter likes to say, when I was a real lawyer before I went to HP, uh, when I was practicing law, I'd run into somebody I knew from law school, and I think that guy was the biggest dope I ever met. Uh, <laughs> you would, it would impact your decision you know, on the case. You'd be like, you'd say to your client, "We'll win this case." Uh, I remember that guy. He was a dope, um, so, um, which is what the engineers, by the way, said about me. So, but that's why I stopped doing it. But uh, yeah, yeah, there, there is. Um, I'd say it in a serious note a little bit differently. You're already shaping your reputation in terms of your long-term life in school. And in each job that you take, you're shaping that reputation. And it's amazing. At your age, you won't believe it, but after you've done this for as long, I walked in here today, I hadn't seen Allison since we graduated from college, and, um, and here she is working here at the University of Notre Dame. You, I run into people. I had to go try a case in Guam. Um, which is a United States territory. And so I flew from Philadelphia to Guam, halfway around the world. When I walked into the courtroom, the guy who was the law clerk to the judge was a guy I went to college with. So um, you, you're going you're gonna to run into people over and over. So you know, it's just something I, I, I would encourage you to think about. Um, and I also say, as a plug for Notre Dame, a core group of, it's funny that when it happens, People from a lot of other schools that are executives of the company don't understand why I say, no, no, that's a, that's a Notre Dame. She, she went to Notre Dame. I, I feel good about, you know, it's, it is a head start in terms of my, my thinking when I talk to them because um, there's a certain core set of values. And it's not better educated, worse educated. There tends to be more of a core value set in the person. Um, which is, which is the, uh, the harder thing to find out in a 45-minute interview. Um, you know, the, the, the grades, the resume speak for themselves. That's the piece you're trying to figure out that uh, gets harder to uh, um, figure out, as I say, in a 30 or 45-minute interview when everybody's on their best behavior. Um, and so that's, that's the reason that I, uh, I focus on things like, did you go to Notre Dame? What else we have time for? We have time for another one. Yep. We, so we go about, and it's it's hard because there's what I call noise in the system. Everybody's trying to get their message out. Right? All the functions, the HR guys got stuff they want to get out. The IT guys want to teach you how to use your computer. The lawyers want to get out the training on compliance. And there's a blast. I'll get 400 emails a day. Um, now, I'm a little higher up, but still, everybody in the company is getting over 100 emails a day. How do you get those messages out for people to hear them? That's one of the biggest challenges we have. So we go about it lots of different ways. We have regular training that we will post on the, or, oper or learning opportunities that we post on our internal portal that people can go click on. Uh, and we send out a blast email, and I, we don't get very high hit rates for that. We have an annual training that we require everybody in the company to do, and we require certification of it. And again, you need the support of the senior business guy. So let me tell you how it works. We have, let's say, 3,000 director and above employees um, in the company, maybe almost 4,000 now. I get a list of everybody who doesn't complete it. And the thing I say to them is I then go to their manager and say, you're going to tell him that I'm going to go to the board of directors in April with my list of guys who didn't do it. And then we'll have the conversation about who should stay and who shouldn't stay. Because this is not optional. This is mandatory. Um, 
And so far, in three years, that list, by the time we get to April, it's zero. Um, now, I have the support of my CEO, who will say, yeah, we are going to take that list to the board of directors. And that's how you, that's how you drive those kinds of things. That's sort of the, the, the hammer. The, the stick, that's the stick, I should say. The carrot that we try to use is, in, in, to go in a different way, a guy who used to be um, a senior guy in the Justice Department when I was there, too, is the general counsel of another company. Together, we came up with this idea. We put together the, these completely cheesy, I should have brought one, cheesy, campy videos. They're called the Ethical, the, the ethical Minute series, and, it's, and it, there's like a little overtone voice where, and they have actors that come in and they'll say, Bob was going to visit a customer today, and then the customer asks him for a bribe or whatever the thing is. And at the end of it, the voice, you know, and you bobble, and, it's, and the key of it is to make it completely cheesy. Just serious enough, but people find these things, so they come out, and, they'll be, and at the end, you'll see Bob walk out and they'll say, what will Bob do? Stay tuned for next week's Ethical Minute. And we, we launched these last year. They're the most popular thing we ever did. People think they're funny, but there's a message behind them. They love them, and they, it's, it's, a, it's a serial. And it goes for three or four weeks. And at the end of it, we have a tape from one of our senior executives talking about what do our standards say about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. We designed one for the engineers in terms of we originally just did them for the whole company. But then, you know, you sit there and say, okay, bribing a customer, who cares? I'm an engineer. I sit in a lab. Um, I'm not going to do that. We got one where we designed falsifying test results and to try and get your product through because you're convinced it's a good product. And, but you know that your manager is going to make a bad decision based on this test, and it really isn't the right test. And, and, we, and we put that video out. And again, people really enjoyed it. So you've got, to, you've got to do it. You've got to find a way. It's like anything else, like marketing. You've got to find a way to reach them. I view it as I have an audience of 300,000. I've got to find out how to reach them. Sometimes I'm going to do it with a stick, and sometimes I'm going to do it with a carrot. And uh, I, travel, I travel the globe more than I would like um, and, and get our employees together in rooms like this, and we talk about those kinds of things. Um, and again, mixing it in with the business, uh, I run our licensing business, so I'm in charge of uh, our intellectual property, our patents, when we sell them or, or license them to somebody else, um, and, and which is also fun to run my own business that, again, in the world of HP, it's tiny. Nobody even cares about it. It would be a Fortune 500 company all by itself um, if we re reported it out as a separate business. But that's, that's for us, we try to find all of those different vehicles to get the communication out there to people. So. OK, we have time for one last question, if anybody would like to ask. I've seen that portfolio. You guys have, like, here's our intellectual property that we're going to list. Which leads to this, make that available to the public, and here's how we're going to list. I'm glad you've seen it. So the, he said that he's seen our portfolio. And in fact, we just, we just, and how do we make the decision? We just launched. Um, online sales of our patents. And they're just, they're just like eBay. You can go in there and buy some of our old patents. So we have over 30,000 patents. And the way a patent works is you pay a fee the day you apply for it. And then every four years until it expires, you've got to pay a new fee. And the fee gets higher and higher and higher because the Patent and Trademark Office says, if you invented it 12 years ago and you still want a patent, it's probably pretty valuable. So we can charge you more money for that. Used to be big companies just applied for them, got them, paid the fees, kept them for 20 years. As, as economics have gotten tighter and as people have gotten smarter, we review that portfolio every year as we're coming up for a new application. We say, do we care? We change, we change the direction we go with business every day. We sell 70 years old. We sell nothing today that we sold when we founded the company. We sell nothing today that we sold 35 years ago. We sell very little today that we sold 20 years ago. It's changing constantly. So we'll have a whole bunch of IP in a particular area, and then we decide that's not the right business for us, or it's just not the right business. Now we've got a whole bunch of patents. So then we, we, we created this business that I run. So the business pays for a patent. If it's, if it's related to a printer, the business pays for main, maintaining that patent. When they say, we don't need this anymore, the business is going in a different direction, they give it to me. And then it's my decision. Is I got a P&L, do I want to keep that fee going because I can sell it to somebody, I can license it to somebody, I can put it up on an auction and get enough money for it. And we go through these and weed them out and abandon a bunch of patents and just get rid of them. And then we make decisions about others that we're going to sell. And sometimes we go direct, we, we bundle a group together and we'll go to a particular customer. We used to be in the camera business. 
our engineers are great. They are, what, the HP Labs is famous for being one of the great labs in the world and some of the great thinkers of new technology. When we got in the camera business, I don't know however many years ago, we had the best intellectual property in the world. We couldn't sell any cameras, but we had the best intellectual property in the world behind it. So when we decided to get out of the camera business, we had all of these patents. People who all of a sudden started getting big, cell phones with cameras in it. So we turn around and decide, let's license the intellectual property that we have for the camera in there to, other, to, to the Nokias of the world, to the Apples of the world that are going to go ahead. So then we've got that business decision. Who do we want to partner with? Who do we not want to partner with? Sometimes we say, we don't want them to be none in since we decided to take the money. But if we can't get enough money, we may say, we don't want anybody to be successful. We'll just keep them, and we won't let anybody have them, and we'll leverage them in other negotiations. But it's become much more of a business decision than it used to be. And the biggest challenge in that is convincing the engineers that's the right thing. Because no engineer ever wants to abandon any patent he ever invented. It's the most important thing. It's their, it's their baby. They want to keep it for forever. And ultimately convincing it and creating a business unit that said this unit, my unit, has to pay for it. I got a bunch of engineers, actually, who work for me, too. Um, we, we have to decide, can we monetize this in a way that's greater than the maintenance fees? Well, listen, um, I just want to thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. I know it's the Friday before Thanksgiving, and, and uh, probably people were getting ready to head out for, uh, for, for break. But I appreciate the oppor opportunity to be here today. So thanks very much. Thanks, Sam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. For those of you that are in the class, make sure you turn in your tennis cards as you leave, and thank you for participation this year.